Five. Five. Curry hits a three. Four. Four. Three. It's a hit by Watt. Sack number ten. Two. Missy. Missy with a record-breaking goal. One. One. Welcome to BSS Sports. Now, here are your hosts, Steve and Trevor. And Trevor. Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of BSS Sports. My name is Stephen Schill with the ever lovely Trevor to the Struthers and the Los Angeles Rams. No longer the St. Louis Rams, Los Angeles Rams. Jeff Fisher, the mustache goatee man of them all, gets an extension after the Rams fall to 4-8. and eight. Does this make any sense, or what, what? what's your thoughts on this? Because in a sport where it seems the coaching constantly gets changed based off performance, the performance lately hasn't been too good. The performance has been some of the worst I think we've maybe ever seen. Uh, that's the thing. I mean, they're, what, 4-8 and eight now? Um, just yesterday in general in that game, they had under 100 yards in total, not rushing, not passing, just in total. They had less than 100 yards at halftime, given they were playing the Patriots, but still um, I, you expect a little bit more from, from your offense. And uh, they turned it on a little bit late, I guess. Uh, Kenny Britt got a touchdown, according to my fantasy team, but uh, uh, it was obviously way too late. And even just the quotes, I mean, I hope he was kidding. Uh, Fisher I'm talking about when he was talking to the media um, ahead of that game against the Patriots with uh, some of the things he was bringing up as like Danny to, Woodhead. Yeah, bring up him and uh, talking about Amendola being part of the rushing game. And meanwhile, he's not a part of any game. He's not even part of the passing game really anymore. He gets like the least targets of anybody on, on, the, on the Patriots. Um, so, I mean, when you can take that into consideration, you take their performance into consideration, you take the fact that he was maybe the last guy that thought they should have started. They should have started starting Jared Goff. Um, it's just been a, a horrendous show. Uh, maybe that's what they want though in, in Los Angeles. I mean, Los Angeles is all about entertainment, and uh, in the very least, the team's not good, and this is entertaining. Well, another interesting thing about the whole Los Angeles realm is the fact that the San Diego Chargers have been in talks about opting out of their contract to or accepting a part of their contract to move to L.A. Why is it that St. Louis isn't having a team and now San Diego isn't going to have a team? Like, what's the point in going to L.A.? Because it doesn't really seem like it's going to be, you know, an overly popular football town. I mean, it'll still get crowds and stuff, but when you start, I don't know, putting teams in mass numbers together instead of spreading them out, I feel like the numbers are just going to diminish. Well, that's the thing with a place like LA is it's an entertainment district, and and to there, I mean, there is like something to be said about having sports there. That is entertainment ultimately, but it's, it sort of gives you the same feeling a sports team in LA as maybe a sports team in Las Vegas does. Just we're more used to sports sporting teams in LA, so it's not as as bizarre as what we're going to see with the NHL in Las Vegas. But uh, it's that same sort of thing. People that go to Los Angeles don't go there to watch sports. People that go to Las Vegas don't go there to, to watch sports. Even people to an extent that go to New York, even though there are historic franchises there, and that definitely helps out the franchises, even though there are historic franchises in New York City, people don't necessarily go there to watch sports. Uh, obviously, there are, there, there are exceptions with uh, teams like the Giants and teams like the Yankees in the area, but uh, and the Rangers as well being an original six franchise, but... You don't necessarily think of sports when you think of those places. You think of, you know, Broadway for New York, entertainment in general for L.A., and gambling for Las Vegas. So uh, that that right there is, is something that uh, is never really going to change. And uh, the only thing they can hope for, both L.A. and Vegas even, since I, I've included them in this conversation, is to have a winning team because that's definitely helped out New York when it comes to trying to make the town a sports town. And talking still on the football side of things, Cam Newton does fantastic last year, creates the dab, all the hype around the guy, and last night, they lose 40-7 to against the Seattle Seahawks. Now, with that being said, I mean, Carolina as a whole really hasn't that, had that much of a year at all. Is there... What is it with Carolina? Do you think this is all Cam Newton, or do you think there's just not many other options besides Kelvin Benjamin and Greg Olson for him? 
I mean, that's true. There aren't. Um, I mean, after that, it's what, Ted Ginn? <laughs> he had, what, like 10, 11 targets uh, last night. So it probably, I mean, he probably had uh, more targets than Greg Olson and maybe even Benjamin. Uh, my opponent had Benjamin in fantasy this week, and he hardly scored two points. Obviously, it was an ugly game, though, for the Panthers. Ginn was the one that had the only touchdown on that uh, long uh, drive downfield, that one pass that Newton threw. But, uh, I mean, this is a product of not only not having much around the quarterback, but the quarterback also being a really young quarterback and having to uh, learn about adjusting to what's around him and how to play. Um, they really don't have much of a rushing game. Uh, Foz Fozzie Whitaker hasn't been given too much of a chance this year, and the guy that they've gone with just hasn't been able to perform. So they do rely a lot on the passing game. And to that, uh, to like the passing game has just been disappointing so far this year, and uh, that's something that... I feel like every NFL offense, they, you need two dynamics. You need to be able to run the ball, and you need to be able to pass the ball. Uh, given the record right now, uh, considering uh, the Bills, I think, are a good team that, that is great at mixing it up. Obviously, they rely a lot on the running game, though. And, uh, I mean, now that they have Sammy Watkins back, even though Percy Harvin's now out, um, they can maybe try to uh, mix up the game well there for the Bills. But, I mean, I think any good NFL offense needs a good mixture of both to be able to perform because otherwise defenses are too smart and they're going to uh, know what you're trying to do and stop it. Well, it's one of those things. I don't. I don't know why I really touched on Cam more so because I mean they gave up over thirty points. Well, I mean forty points. That's another so. thing too. Their defense isn't any good. <laughs> I mean, they, they were playing uh, the Seahawks, who I mean Russell Wilson's a fantastic quarterback. Struggled for a good half of the season, but that's a team that uh, I don't know if you could expect them to put up forty points in a game this year, especially against a team that was just in the Super Bowl this past year. Uh, obviously, they weren't going to give up uh, four, or the Broncos weren't going to give up forty points to to Seattle. So <laughs> the only one from the Super Bowl that would be able to would be Carolina, but. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, that's an offense that in Seattle that's pretty good. It's not great, and uh, they got crushed by that offense last night. And switching over to basketball, Mr. Russell Westbrook. I mean, when people said that Westbrook was going to be pissed off over the Kevin Durant thing, there's nothing like we're seeing right now with Russell Westbrook. And you could say he's probably going to win the MVP. He just posts his fifth straight triple-double in a win. Five games in a row that he's done that. I mean, he's taken the – to an extent, it's almost a problem that he's doing this much for Oklahoma because, I mean, if he goes down, <laughs> Oklahoma, we have a problem. Like, if Russell yeah. Westbrook goes down, there's going to be a problem. What's, what do you think that the Oklahoma Thunder need to do? Do, they, do we just keep riding this Russell Westbrook train, or do we be like, hey, hi, Russell, you're great, you got great style, this and that, but you need to incorporate everybody else a bit more so because if you go down, we're going to be out of luck. Or what do you think? Well, basketball is one of those rare sports where you can have one guy, to an extent, uh, carry a team. I mean, obviously, it's still a team sport, and you know, you need guys grabbing rebounds. Uh, I mean, if he's picking up triple doubles, it means he's he's probably getting those rebounds. But uh, he's not the the big on on the floor that's going to get the most, uh, and that's something that uh, is very much a team dynamic. Because usually, that big that's getting all those rebounds isn't going to be the guy that's dropping all the points. So um, there's that dynamic there that you need. But I mean. We've seen it with LeBron James, uh, with Cavaliers teams in the past, before he came back to Cleveland, that, uh, yeah, one player, when he's playing out of his mind and picking up triple doubles, can, to an extent, carry a team. And we're seeing that now in Oklahoma City with uh, Russell Westbrook. And uh, is it out of anger against Durant? I don't know. I, I think it, it's just he's a fantastic player, and now he gets the ball more in OKC. Then, then and he doesn't have to worry about uh, sharing it with Durant, and he's playing well. And if it's resulting in wins for OKC, I think you got to keep it as is. Uh, don't really try to uh, to do too much more. I mean, he's he's picking up about. Uh, 10 assists whenever he, do, he does these triple doubles, right? Whenever he p picks up a triple double. So uh, uh, he is moving the ball and he's looking to other guys and those other guys are making shots for him to get assists. So um, to an extent, there is still that team dynamic. But yeah, I mean, obviously the offense runs through uh, Russell Westbrook and if that's working for OKC, I mean, they, they shouldn't change it up. Now, two teams in the East that everybody's kind of looking at this year was the Boston Celtics and the New York Knicks, mainly because of their pickups. Boston Celtics getting Al Horford, and then obviously with the Knicks picking up Joe Kim Noah and Rose and a few others. But it, it's weird to think that 
New York has been able to make this big shift because last year, the past couple of years, it's been okay. New York has been bad, bad, bad. Derrick Rose comes back. You know, it's it's the hype of Derrick Rose that's coming into New York, but now it's the actuality. Okay, we're eleven and nine. We're doing well. People are playing together. I mean, it looks like New York's going to be in the playoffs for the first time in a while. Not the not the Brooklyn Nets. They're 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 out of here. They're <laughs> they're probably getting the first round pick if it's not the Seventy Sixers. But with New York and Boston, do you think that their rivalry is going to start heating back up again now that these teams are actually good? I feel like there's always that hatred, just a little bit, whether it be the Rangers-Bruins, obviously the Red Sox-Yankees, between the, the, the two cities, because um, they are two of the bigger, more successful overall markets in, um, in, in the, that we have. So, I mean, even if it's like the Giants and the Patriots, which I, to- I totally left out, because those are also obviously Boston and, and New York-generated uh, teams. But, um, I mean, yeah, it's, I think that there's still that hatred there, but obviously it stands out when it's two good teams. Uh, that's why, you know, the Giants and, and Patriots will probably come to a lot of people's mind, and obviously the Red Sox and Yankees, because, you, you, you know, you think about good teams that uh, always have a chance to win a championship. Those are the rivalries that, uh, that really stick out. Um, obviously, neither of these teams are probably going to contend for a championship this year, but uh, in uh, a, a, a weak Eastern Conference, I mean, they got a shot to uh, do some sort of damage, whether it be make the playoffs and, and uh, have a close first series, or maybe win a round, depending on their on their matchup. Um, it, it's only good for the sport, I think, for a, a good team in New York City, and uh, even to an extent, as much as I seem to dislike. Uh, fans from Boston uh, and just the kind of aura they give off. Um, it's good to have a great sports team in Boston as well. You know, I'm a Bruins fan, but I genuinely agree with you. They, I, I went there for a Raptors game, and the fan it was wasn't really exactly a pleasant experience. But then again, Toronto was probably the worst. And I'm from Canada. <laughs> anyway, with that being said, uh, the Dallas Mavericks, they're 4-15. and And this year, they picked up Harrison Barnes from the Golden State Warriors. Points per game, they're 30th in the league. Rebounds per game, they're 30th. Nothing is going right for them, and it's just going straight downhill really quickly. I know Mark Cuban's a great guy, but if you're Dallas, isn't this kind of concerning that the last couple of years you've basically been in the playoffs, almost all of them, and now you're basically last in the Western Conference and the entire NBA? I I mean, the 76ers still got you beat, but still, (laughs) you're down there with them. I mean, yeah, I, th- I think you, uh, no doubt, I mean, they weren't in the finals that long ago, so I'm, I'm curious to kind of think about, you know, what fans are are, uh, are thinking when it comes to the team, and obviously they're not happy with how this year's gone, but uh, there is this process in professional sports where, um, where you need to rebuild, and uh, they're not exactly doing that, but, uh, I mean, maybe this is a message from the basketball gods that uh, it's time to uh, strip it down, do a complete rebuild, and uh, it wouldn't be too surprising to see the Dallas Mavericks doing well, not only making the playoffs, but maybe doing some damage within the, the next five years. Now, Saturday. Saturday is a big day, Trevor. Do you want to know why Saturday is a big day? I want to, uh, actually, I don't know. So I was going to guess, but uh, I'll let you tell me. Toronto FC is taking on the Seattle Sounders at BMO Field. See, I wasn't going to go that way. (laughs) Well, Trevor, I'm thoroughly disappointed because this is the first time that Toronto has been in the final. Cough, cough. That was a joke. (laughs) Never mind. That was was brutal. Anyway, uh, but no, it's the first time that any two non- original MLS teams are in the final. Every single year, there's been at least one of the original MLS teams in the final. This year, it's all expansion teams, which is kind of cool. Uh, the fact that Montreal almost made it, and they've been in the, the league like five or less years, as Toronto's been in it for like 10 or more, that's kind of concerning. But uh, we, hey, we made it. That's all that matters. <laughs> that is all that matters. Clint Irwin, Josie Altador, Sebastian Giovinco, and all the boys up in Toronto they're going to uh, be inviting Seattle down, and hopefully they're going to crush them. Like, I'm I'm really hoping for this one. But the, the main problem that I have with this, and this is going to be our final topic for the day, so I just want to talk about it for a minute, is Toronto charging for their sports is ridiculous. When you looked at Toronto FC versus Montreal, in Toronto, tickets were $300 for your average Geo ticket. Now, with Montreal, they were like $100. And for this final, the average Geo ticket is now 800 or higher. 
What is it with Toronto and milking the citizens and fans, or do they have to do this to keep away certain people? Like, I, I just, I don't, I don't understand this. Can you explain why Toronto does this to their fans? They don't have to, but it works, and that's the thing. Um, they're in obviously a, a, the, pretty much the biggest market in Canada, and they take advantage of that with all the, the surrounding towns and such and the fact that uh, Toronto is, is just so big. There's a lot of people clearly that live in the area. Uh, there are a lot of people from um, different backgrounds as well where soccer is such a prominent uh, sport for them either growing up or even now. Um, and they'll be willing to fork out that money. There's a lot of uh, good-paying jobs that people seem to have around Toronto to be able to afford some expensive condos and uh, be able to make the trip to uh, BMO Field. So um, for them, this probably isn't isn't that much of, uh, of a price to pay. <laughs> I know you probably wanted to uh, go to this game, but uh, that's a bit much for you uh, being a college student. But uh, for the, the folks that uh, have a lot of money and uh, that uh, have uh, lived, breathed, and uh, died by soccer, not that you haven't, but uh, I mean, this is something that uh, for them, it could very well be once in a lifetime. And uh, the organization is doing a great job capitalizing on it, and no doubt it's going to sell out. That's it for this edition of BSS Sports. Make sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter at BSS Sports. For Trevor Struthers and myself, Stephen Schill, we'll catch you next.